Hi EXers, welcome to the EX Podcast episode number 65. This is your host, Stefan Vincent. I'm here today with you because we need to shake things up in the world of HR, talent acquisition and company culture in order to create positive employee experiences in our organizations. Your workplace doesn't have to be a dreadful place where employees feel disengaged. This podcast brings a different lens to the HR, employee engagement and company culture conversation. We approach these topics from a brand and customer experience perspective rather than a traditional HR perspective. Our guests are thought leaders and disruptors in the EX space in their own way come to this show to share best practices on the key elements that foster employee engagement and strengthen company culture, and also to spark the conversation on how to create these positive employee experiences. Not every company can do what Airbnb or Google do around their employee experience, and this is what the show is all about sharing stories of companies of all sizes, not only to show that EX doesn't require a large budget or large team, but also that there isn't one recipe. Each company can find its own way through the EX journey. Today's guest is Meredith Ferguson, Managing Director at Do Something Strategic, based in New York City. Today with Meredith, we talk about... What are some of the misconceptions we have about Gen Y in the workplace? What companies need to do differently to cater to Gen Y without alienating older generations? How Gen Z is different from Gen Y and what companies need to do to prepare for Gen Z's arrival to the workplace? And what the workplace will look like in five years? This episode is brought to you by Spring International. Spring is a women-owned boutique firm that focuses on performance-based employee engagement and people analytics. From onboarding to exits, Spring uses proven techniques to help companies improve the employee experience and calculate the ROI of HR programs and initiatives. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Meredith. And because it takes a good amount of time to produce this podcast, please make sure to review the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, TuneIn, or YouTube, as it will help promote the content. If you want me to speak at your next event, get some advice on your EX initiatives, or send me feedback or suggestions for future topics or guests, you can reach me at svincent at exsummit.com or on Twitter at ex underscore summit. All right, let's get to it. Hello, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the EX podcast. Very excited for today's guest, Meredith Ferguson. She is the managing director of Do Something Strategic. Meredith, thanks for joining us today. Happy to be here. Tell us who, who you are, what's your background, and what your company does. Sure. So um, I, I run the agency that is the consulting arm of DoSomething.org. And so Do Something Strategic takes all of the insights and data that DoSomething.org has collected over the last 25 years on engaging young people for social impact uh, and we use that to help other brands and other organizations better understand, connect with, and build relationships with young people. And, and, and we define young people as anyone under the age of 25. Do Something.org is, is really a tech platform. It's the largest organization for young people in social change. And we give young people, again, between the ages of 13 and 25, the opportunity to uh, engage on causes they care about. We have over 270 cause initiatives that they can take action on, on our tech platform, and they can get involved in ways that don't require money, don't require an adult, don't require a car. We make basically volunteering simple, easy, and fun. 
And because it's a tech platform, we collect a ton of data on how they engage, where they communicate, what gets them motivated and get and gets them to take action and, and go the next step. Um, so we really collect a lot, a lot of information. And they also, we, we have conversations with, uh, you know, 6 million young people every week. We text with nearly 3 million young people every week. We um, email, we of course have social engagement with these young people, but also through our tech platform, tech platform, we capture um, conversations that we have with them directly. And it's really um, provides such a rich data set because that's a way for us to better understand sort of really their motivations and why they're getting involved and what's what really makes them tick because we do a lot of natural language sentiment analysis on the um, conversations we have with them to better understand how we can build both uh, a platform and experiences for them that resonate and, and get them excited. Uh, what, what led you to your actual or current position at Do Something Strategic? Yeah, so I was working, um, I've had sort of a career in marketing and, and agency work for quite some time. And I was just working at an agency and was interested in getting back involved in, you know, more social good. I had, I had led some projects uh, at the agency that were focused on social good and purpose. And I really found a lot of, you know, excitement and meaning in those. And so I thought, gee, I really think I want to get back into that work more full time. And I was doing some research on that and came across this agency that focuses entirely on, Uh, purpose and young people, um, and just was totally enamored with everything they do and, and stand for. And they happen to have been looking for a managing director, so I applied, and that's that. That's pretty easy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sounds a little tough, but yeah, I mean, it was the crazy part was moving from uh, Cincinnati, which is where I was, to New York City with my whole family. So yeah, that, that was the hard part. That's quite a change, yes. <laughs> All right. We've talked a lot the past few years about how Gen Y or millennials have disrupted the workplace. And, you know, there are a lot of misconceptions about really what Gen Y are looking for, um, what they really want to, to see when they join a company. What are some of those misconceptions that uh, companies or that we have, all of us, on uh, Gen Y in the workplace? Yeah, I mean, I think the biggest misconception that I see out there is that Gen Y, and, and that's sort of spilling into Gen Z, the misconception that they just want to be praised and just want to be given an award for doing nothing. We have not found that to be true at all. We have, believe it or not, as, as an organization of over 60 people at DoSomething.org, we employ nearly 90% of our base is, is Gen Y and Gen Z. So... Um, and it's, it's, it's actually an incredibly engaged group and it's wanting praise. It's about wanting feedback. And those two things are very, very different. And I think when Gen Y, um, and again, now seeping into the younger generation, Gen Z are asking for more feedback, that doesn't mean they're asking for praise. They're asking for valuable, actionable ways that they can improve And so annual performance reviews, for instance, just don't cut it anymore. They're saying, no, I, I want more. I want frequent feedback so that I can Im improve and move up. So I think that that's, uh, that's where that misperception is coming from. Uh, and I think the companies that are responding appropriately are the ones that are saying, ah, we get it. Constant feedback is important to you. Let's make sure that we put in weekly check-ins, quarterly reviews, so that you know, our communications is, is stronger than ever. Gen Y, you know, is, is, it's a massive, it's a huge population of individuals uh, in the workplace right now. Uh, but many of the older generations are in leadership or management roles. And again, they still have that sort of misconception of Gen Y. So what companies need to do to maybe retrain their managers and leadership to be able to better empathize and relate to the Gen Y population? I, I think the biggest training simply comes around communication. I think there's this, um, again, this perception, misperception that young people, young employees are not willing to put in the time and effort and they just want, you know, to, to get moved up. And, and that's actually not true. And once they open those doors of communication and see that, oh, what they really want is what every human wants, right? Which do, they just want their work to be noticed, 
They want their work to be valued. They want to be critiqued and more than anything, they want their work to matter in the bigger sense, right? They want it to have purpose and impact on their community and the workplace and in the world. And so it's really about sort of redefining what communication means and, and treating young employees as competent, creative, capable employees. And all of that results in a better, more engaged workforce. And I don't think that's unique to this generation necessarily. Like I said, I think these are human principles. I think what's unique is that this generation is demanding it in ways that previous generations never have. Right. It, it's a good point. Now, when, when you work for a company that has a very deep, already a deep purpose, well established and well known even outside of the company from you know um, the consumer standpoint, it's easier to better craft the message to the millennials about finding a sense of purpose for companies that don't really have that recognition of as a brand to serve a specific purpose. What companies need to do to be able to build that narrative so that, again, the Gen Y and the Gen Z find a, a, a true purpose in their mission working mm -hmm. within the company? Yeah, I mean, this may be not shared by a lot of people, but I believe every brand has a purpose. Sometimes just brands bury it or forget about it or felt like it, it doesn't matter. And all that really matters is, is the sales. And so I think that really it's about sort of dusting it off or uncovering it, you know, kind of digging deep and finding out what's that ambitious, motivating reason why your brand existed to begin with. And that doesn't have to be a complicated redefining of your brand. It just has to be a thoughtful, um, credible, authentic, genuine expression of why you exist. And I think a great way, if you haven't done that, or you're a legacy brand that has that sort of buried deep, a great way to engage your biggest ambassadors, which are your employers, is to get them engaged in the discussion about it. Um, this doesn't have to be top down. It can really be something that is um, explored as a, a community of, of workforce and I think that's where, if you haven't had it before, that's where you can really find some passionate, um, amazing people who can um, really, you know, step up their their own leadership game and, and get involved in building it. As we know, Gen Y, as consumers and employees, look for more authentic relationships with brands and also more personalized experiences. So what companies need to do differently to not only cater to Gen Y, but also doing this without alienating older generations? So we call this, we, we actually wrote a book on this called The XYZ Factor, and we talk about how really creating a culture that sort of breeds the successful coming together of, of generations is really about a mindset, not so much about an age or even, even a place. It, it's, it's about a culture where innovation, accessibility, transparency are the new norm and are celebrated and um, encouraged. So it's really about an environment that's created by behaviors and, and values, not so much this top-down, you know, policy manual that, you know, leadership and external lawyers or board members put together. And, and so it's, it's really a mindset. It's about adopting principles that provide this new kind of culture where intergenerational productivity is expected. And the core of all of it is communication. It's about accessibility and, and transparency, not, not so much literally, but sort of really opening the doors and allowing all members of the workplace to be a valued contributor. It's like we say here, everyone has a voice. That doesn't mean everyone has a vote. But when you give everyone a voice, it creates a whole different kind of um, culture that then breeds, you know, productivity, innovation, and and a workplace that's way more efficient. So a key is really to be able to involve, um, no, I would say, all generation into building a new narrative, finding a or redefining the purpose of the company, why the company is in business. And to be able to identify what are the different touch points along the employee journey that's, again, across generations, employees are looking for. Is it what you're saying? 
Yeah. I mean, I think you're right. It's about empowering everyone. It's young people in particular in the workplace do best when they're given their a, a real chance to share their ideas and they're given them to own their own work. And so rather than the sort of old mantra of just empowering the hippos, as we call them, which are the highest paid people <laughs> in the office, Young people expect a more inclusive and transparent culture. And so when they're made to feel like they're being heard and they pro- they provide to the company, that's when you're going to see success across all generations. Um, so, you know, it's really about providing those forums and those communication avenues where anyone can present and weigh in on what's valuable to the organization and what's not. We, we know that, um, you know, again, younger generations, Gen Y, Gen Z are much more influenced by technology than older generations. Mm-hmm. What does what place does technology play play in you know including um, you know, those younger employees into you know redefining what the culture should be about, redefining the purpose of the company, but also what place technology plays into getting uh, enhancing that communication and getting that feedback. Yeah, I I would say for young people, technology is just a tool. They don't necessarily see it as a substitute. They see it as a tool to enable productivity, efficient works. You you know, it's not something that they say, I'd rather have my feedback from you via an online or mobile enabled form. It's really that says, if that's the most efficient way to close, it great. That's how we should be collecting it. But I still expect that in real life, face-to-face conversation on a weekly basis, on a quarterly basis when it comes to reviews. And so I think there's a misperception that everything needs to be tech enabled when I think what they say is it doesn't need to be tech enabled unless that makes it more productive and more efficient. It's not meant to, technology is not meant to replace the human um, connection from mentorship to leadership opportunities to reviews to cross-functional, uh, cross-departmental meetings. Like, sure, if, if, if you need to sort of use technology to create the idea that we can all be in one space, even though we're in three different cities, great. But let's not forget that that needs to be uh, technology is the tool that enables that. It's not the substitute that says, great, we're all just going to sit in our rooms and take calls from our our bedrooms, because that's not what they're asking for. That's not what they're expecting. What What would be the first steps for a for a company CEO or company executive to put together a, a plan or initiative where you know what we have to be more inclusive. We have to be more understanding of the different the different sentiments and the different cultures and the different uh, needs of all our employee groups. Um, what would be the sort of the first steps that we recommend for a, a leader or an executive to start with to be able to get that uh, input and that insights, gather those insights and get that feedback from from all of the employees, not just the younger ones, but all of them? I mean, I think it starts with sort of uh, asking for that from the sort of key people in your organization that are representative of the groups you're trying to reach. I think it can be as simple as a task force, but I also don't think it has to be as complicated as a a formal um, process that you put in place. It really is um, being involved in the culture of the organization by being out there. I mean, truly, we had a a woman here who was a CMO. Her name is... um, Linda Bosch, CMO of GE, and she talked about how they too have an open environment where our CEO sits among all of us. We have an open environment here um, in our office, our CEO, our COO, where we all sit in the same um, open space. And uh, we loved it when we heard that Linda Bosch, the CMO of GE, also said the same thing. She said, we have an open office space and it has allowed me to have these discussions and appreciate the needs and the challenges in a whole new way. And I think that that can be a really easy start is get out of that corner office and, um, and be among the team that is performing the work every day. All right. So you don't need to have a very sophisticated um, set of data and tools to be able to gather insights and um feedback from your employees you can start very easily by um, some focus groups some very easy surveys uh, without going all the way through super sophisticated technology 
Oh, absolutely. And I, and the, the only key to all of that is, is the expectation of the young person. If you're going to ask them, you better close the loop. So you better <laughs> know what happened with that information, what changed, what evolved, even if nothing changed, you can say, I really heard you. We're not able to deploy what we talked about, but it's really made me think. So there has to be a close the loop because that's what transparency, which is what we're talking about is mm-hmm. all about. It's about acknowledging that I want your opinion and here's what I'm doing with it. Otherwise, it feels like it goes into a vacuum and it wasn't a genuine expression of interest. So it's not so much about executing on everything that they're asking for. It's more about getting the inputs, getting their their feedback and identify what makes sense for for the company to uh, implement and execute on. Uh, And if not everything is applicable or can be implemented, it's to share why we can't do this absolutely every like our organization mantra is everyone has a voice not everyone has a vote leadership is still leadership here right Mm -hmm. leadership is still an important function and still needs to provide the direction but if you're serious about valuing everybody's input then you need to let them know that by letting them know yes i want it and here's how we're going to act on it thanks for everyone's you know contributions and so yeah, they don't. It's not a democracy, but it is a, a transparent culture where you ask for feedback. One of the, the simplest ways we do it um, here at this organization is we have quarterly dinners, and people can put. Um, we use a digital form, or and we use a jar. However, people want to do it. We provide all the options where they can ask questions of leadership of the executive team. And the executive team, we sit in the front and we have dinner. And uh, for everybody and anybody will read the questions and we answer every single question that was submitted. And we invite uh, in real life questions at the dinner as well. And it creates a really, you know, engaging, fruitful discussion that provides some good feedback, but also good direction for the future. So you mentioned GE as an example of, um, you know, the CEO sitting among the employees, having a very open communication internally. Uh, do you have any other examples where companies, whatever size, have been able to even change a little bit their corporate mindset to embrace those younger generations? I mean, when you think of GE, GE is a great example because GE is, uh, I mean, it's not what it used to be in the past, right? They're in a completely different business than where they started, but it's it was uh, it's a very well-established company, um, almost 100 years old or even a bit more, probably, at least for some other divisions. But they've been able to adapt and update and get more um, and stay current and relevant to different generations. Um, so, do you have any other any mm-hmm. other examples in mind of companies who were able to embrace those younger generations and therefore change the way they think about the workplace? Yeah, I mean, I think an organization that is doing this so so well is PwC. I mean, this is an oh, organization. Yes. Yeah. I mean, they're huge. I mean, what a, what a huge organization. And it's like, you know, turning that Titanic. I mean, the good news for PwC is they were always very steeped in purpose and, and valued, um, you know, all employee contribution, but for an organization that large, it was really hard to do. And I think that they have taken, well, I can say, you know, they've taken their, um, desire to be a purpose oriented workforce in a huge direction that is really attractive to young people. They've kind of moved from what companies, all, all big companies do, which is the, you know, annual, you know, cutting a check every year for the giving campaign. And, you know, this volunteer day that most organizations offer these things. And what PwC has done has said, Oh, I see what this younger generation wants. They, it's not enough to just say company purpose matters. And we have these couple initiatives. They want to see how they can give back more consistently, more um, holistically as an individual and as a as an engaged workforce. And so they said, great, we're going to go beyond this once a year volunteer day. We're going to go beyond our annual fall corporate giving program. We're going to really appeal to their sense of purpose by creating opportunities for employees to get engaged around a variety of social good initiatives year round. And it really allows for alignment with young people's personal interests and their time constraints. It really, they, they've created a, an engagement ecosystem that is varied as, as varied as their employee base, frankly. And they're really listening and saying, we hear you. We understand this is not a one size fits all purpose driven opportunity. We're going to give you the range of opportunities so that you can feel 
that valued um, both as an employee, but also as a community member. And I just think that that is so progressive and smart and important. Now, on the corporate side, there is that misconception that in order to cater and to be relevant and attract younger talents, they have to come up with all those very cool perks and great benefits, right? Um, you know, from you know, bin bags and ping pong tables in the office space to unlimited vacation time to uh, flexibility or whatever else. But those are, you know, I would say nice to haves, but they're not necessarily what's going to make a difference. They're not, first of all, they're not differentiators from one company to another. Right. It's not what's going to make a, uh, a young employee or young candidates pick one company versus the other. So is it really what the purpose the comp- what the purpose of the company is that really is what uh, is the differentiator in, in terms of attracting talent? I think it's two things. I think it's one part purpose and one part culture. And I think culture sure is that I think what people believe culture is, is bean bags and <laughs> snacks, right. And the soda machine or whatever. And I think, sure, that's part of it. Fine. That can be part of it. But I think culture that matters, culture that gets people excited to wake up every day and go to work is both related to purpose and related to how the organization values that employee and their voice. And I think that that's where there's no amount of bean bags. There are no amount of snacks. <laughs> that will make up for the uh, idea that you um, do the budget, set the vision, and execute um, sort of big, big overarching principles in a corner without getting anyone else engaged. There's you know, no amount of free vacation days that matter to young people if you have a culture that says, we're going to work you to the bone you know, 15 hours a day, and we don't want to hear what you have to say about it. So th- there's... I think that the culture has been, it's, it's easy to see culture that is bean bags and fun office spaces and ping pong tables. It's harder to see culture that is parent and, um, accessible and innovative and open to failing forward and giving everyone a voice and valuing everyone's contribution, not just the highest paid people in the office, the hippos. So I think that that's where there's a lot of misperception out there around what culture really is and what what young people really value. Companies that are more traditional and more conservative in their culture and their mindsets, is it a lost cause for them to be able to change that mindset to be uh, more engaging and more relevant to younger generations? Or can they also change the way they approach the workplace experience to be able to cater and be relevant to those uh, these younger generations? I actually think, first of all, it's never too late. So yes. And I actually think these big uh, companies and their HR teams are really having their moment right now. And rightly so. I mean, they they, these big companies are appreciating that the key to um, the key to sort of brand ambassadorship are their employees, and so they really are trying very hard to figure out how can we be more relevant and and provide a more meaningful employee engagement strategy that we've never really thought of before beyond the standard sort of um, operating procedures that pretty much everyone has. And so I think that actually the ones that are doing it well are the ones who have been around for a really long time. And they're showing everybody, Hey, you don't have to just have started 10 years ago, Facebook to be cool and relevant and, and meaningful. Um, so you see the organizations like GE, you see organizations like Johnson and Johnson and, and Unilever. And of course, PwC, you see these huge legacy brands, um, creating culture that matters to young people and they're, they're getting recruitment because of it. So is, is it more a matter of, obviously, you know, it has to start with the leadership. If the leadership doesn't embrace that change, uh, it's not going to succeed uh, in any matter. It's not a manager, level two, level three manager that is going to bring that change to the organization. Now, you can start small with uh, you know, specific teams where you can try to run some programs and see what are the results and try to scale those up from there. But it usually starts with the top, right? Yeah. I mean, I think that's absolutely fair. I think the the leadership still drives 
um, the, the culture for the organization. And I think that, um, that's why you see leaders like Howard Schultz at Starbucks. I mean, you see these people who are so progressive and so, um, in tune with appreciating the value that the employees bring to the brand experience for their customers and, and how important that employee engagement becomes to sort of drive technical, which is profit. Sure. Um, so I think that leadership is incredibly important, and I think we have a lot of enlightened leaders out there, surely. Um, and the ones who um, are not are sort of resistant or just not as open to evolution are the ones who will find that their companies are not going to attract the best talent, and then that's going to impact their business long term. Right. So we we talked about you know finding the purpose, and uh, the purpose of this podcast is to bring a different a different perspective to the employee experience. So you know I'm I'm not critical of the HR function and HR professionals, but the way they've been trained was mostly around the policies and compliance and regulations and not so much about empathy to the employees. Now, most of the HR people I know are empathetic with the employees, but the way their roles are defined doesn't allow to be able to embrace and execute on their personal feelings and how they would like to change things. So going back to you know, more established organizations, older organizations such as PwC, GE, and others, what companies need to do to change that mindset? Do they need to get the, you know, the design of the employee experience and the company culture outside of HR? Do they need to extend it to um, other teams? Do they need to bring more people from different backgrounds within HR? What are your thoughts on this? Yeah, I mean, I think I think the the interesting part is sort of HR as the big, big uh, overarching umbrella. It's really the talent acquisition folks, the talent recruitment folks that are driving this because they're the ones that are on the ground seeing the need to um, evolve the way the company call, um, is engaging employees at, at at every level. And so I think they're the ones that are sort of really seeing it because they're the ones that are they're the ones that are connecting with the young generation that is driving this force. So I think so I think the chief talent officer, the chief, you know, HR, you know, people person, whatever the title ends up being, is always the one that needs to be the voice of not just policy but of culture. And you see some of these organizations creating new new um, positions for diversity, inclusion, culture, people. Ours is called chief of fun. I mean, I think there is this understanding that. It's not just about policies and um, and is something bigger. And um, but but leaders still matter. I think really it's about staying in touch with um, the sort of pipeline of 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 employees, and that's really where you're going to find uh, the future of of the culture and the and of the of the business model. So um, yeah, I mean I think that the, the talent acquisition folks are the ones that bear this burden. And I think the ones who are, are the loudest are the ones that are creating uh, company change. So it's hard. Um, it's not insurmountable. And I think that organizations um, are seeing that this is a new way of operating. Um, and like I said, there's the, even though there are plenty of legacy brands that are evolving and, and growing and um, creating a new norm in their cultural approach so that it attracts a new base of employees, and they're starting to see that it doesn't necessarily uh, alienate the older generation. Yes, and as you said earlier, it's never too late to change. We, we talked uh, for quite some time about Gen Gen Y, and obviously, you know, I'd like to focus a bit more on on Gen Z right now. I know that there's not a lot of data uh, about Gen Z in the workplace because they're just right now entering the workplace so there's not enough history to get relevant data but from all your observation that you've done mostly on the consumer space uh, with Gen Z what are some of the differences that you're seeing from Gen Z versus uh, other generations? Yeah I mean I think the biggest one is they're so much more purpose oriented and so they're the most socially active civically engaged generation ever and so it's really about how does that sort of how do the purpose driven initiatives and, and the, the true vision of the organization, the company come to life for those young workers. 
And that's really about appealing to that sense of purpose that they have, that they want in their life, in their community, certainly in their work, and creating opportunities for these young employees to engage in social good initiatives year round, that it's that it goes beyond the sort of once a year type initiatives that have typically driven. So that I think is the biggest um, opportunity, but also um, biggest piece that Gen Z is driving, which is you know, it's just sort of company purpose and how that comes to life in a new way. And even more so than Gen Y. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I think Gen Y cares about it, certainly. But Gen Y was content with the once a year volunteer day. Gen Y was consent, content cutting a check uh, for the annual giving program. And I think what Gen Z is saying is like, ooh, no. And I think you see a lot of nonprofit organizations struggling with this very thing, too, right? They, have too, had annual giving campaigns. They, too, have had volunteer days that they... Um, create for companies. And what young people are saying is I, that doesn't add value to, in my life. That's not how I want to engage in a um, socially active way. And so that's where companies like PwC are seeing that. And they're already saying, oh, okay, I see. Let us create a, a broader based and a more varied uh, ecosystem of opportunities that allow this, this younger generation to engage in social good um, in new and varied ways so that we keep them, we keep them, um, at, at both as employees, but as employees that value uh, a purpose oriented culture. So let me ask you a question. Maybe that's a tough question. We'll see how you answer this one, but let, let's say that you are, you know, you're twenties and you know, you didn't do industry that great in college and you ended up working in retail or you end up working in um, production plants that makes cars, right? Mm -hmm. For those type of roles, it's probably a bit harder to really define a purpose, not for the company, but even for their job specifically. And so what would you suggest companies to do for you no know, more tactical, more basic type of work and how to define or to find a purpose in those jobs? Yeah. I think it, it can be about the, so if you're working at a car company or, you know, and this car company has committed to, um, some sustainable goals, right? Some, some idea of, you know, reducing the carbon footprint and that's just what the company is committed to. It can be really, that's like, that's great. But it's hard to make that the employee feel like they're a part of that or that they're part of an organization that celebrates and values that, a, a, a clean world. And so if you're a car company, it's about figuring out how can we get them to engage in this idea of sustainability that makes them feel connected to our purpose and our goals around sustainable um, plants or sustainable production, but, but also um, make them feel good about the company and also... It, you know, tie it back to their job. And I think that that can be really, really simple. And a great example of that is something we did with PBH, which is a big retail company. They have a ton of retail employees around the world and they were doing a lot of sustainability initiatives, um, around water stewardship in sort of in Vietnam and Thailand. It was, it these were places that were hard for employees globally to wrap their arms around. They never saw them. They were river basins. I mean, this wasn't anything that was re very tangible, but, but the company, PVH, knew that purpose mattered to their retail employees especially. And so they wanted to give them a way to feel connected to these water stewardship efforts, but at the same time knew that they couldn't necessarily bring everyone to the water basins, you know, river basins in Vietnam. So what they did was um, we created a series of water stewardship initiatives that reinforced their own uh, um, impact on water stewardship. And there were things as simple as like everybody wear blue on this day to show our commitment to water. Everybody tell us how you we're going to, we're giving everyone a challenge to use one cup of water to do your entire morning routine from washing your face to brushing your teeth. Right. So, so there are these sort of water based challenges. We called it PBH 2 And, um, really got people excited around the work that the company was doing and the purpose around sustainable fashion and practices and production brought it to life in their everyday lives and as employees of PBH. So it, 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 it feels like esoteric, but when you bring it home and, and bring it to their daily lives, um, it can be very impactful. And then they all felt so much better. They were like, wow, I work for a company that really cares. 
I work for a company that's really doing something around sustainable production in a way that they never felt before because all they did was read about it in an annual report. So what you're saying is there's always a way, no matter what a business a company is in, or whatever, no matter what your actual job is as well, there's always a way and a mean to find a specific purpose to get you excited and engaged in what you do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, a last question before we go to more uh, fun questions to wrap up the conversation. Again, from all the research that you've done with uh, younger generations over the years, how do you see the workplace evolve in the next five to 10 years? I think you'll see greater importance placed on certainly purpose and impact, both on, on the, in the community where the organizations uh, have shop, you know, have their uh, headquarters or have their a footprint, but also in the world, just thinking about their role in um, purpose and impact more broadly. Um, and then I also think you'll start to see a, a, a more valued work base. So this idea that good ideas can come from anywhere and that everyone you hire is capable and competent and creative and um, that cr by creating this culture of transparency and opportunity, it really does um, bolster engagement and productivity. I think that that's what you'll start to see is this newfound sense of, oh, we don't have to hide our budget. We can let everybody see the books and we're not revealing anything except, hey, this is where we are. I mean, I know that sounds crazy. I will say we do it here. Certainly, no, we don't We don't let everyone sell. He's known, but they see the line item that is people in our budget and that's okay. And they see the line item that is rent and they see the line item that is benefits, all those things. And I think that to me is the future Of, um, of business to create a more engaged workforce and one that's more committed to both the company, its mission, uh, and ultimately to the profit. And I know of a few companies actually who, who do, that do what you do as well in terms of transparency and even open up the books to the employees. So yes, I've it's, it's possible. That don't do that. Yeah. I've worked at companies that like that was all in a room and nobody knew about it. And I'll tell you, it feels wildly different here. It, everybody feels they, like, before they, you know, use a post-it note, they think, like, okay, do I need this post-it note? I see where this is on the budget. And I'm exaggerating here, but I think it, it provides a level of responsibility uh -huh. to uh, what we're all trying to, to accomplish. And I think that's really exciting. I think young people value that, and, they, and it shows them that um, every decision matters. And so then they become more engaged and, and feel responsible and committed. Yeah, it's a sort of a micro micro empowerment and uh, decision making responsibility as well. Right. Yes. All right. So before we wrap it up for today, uh, let me ask you some fun questions. Then, sure. um, if you were to pick someone, a, hist a historical figure, someone famous, uh, and invite that person to dinner, who would that be, and why? Can they be alive? Yes. Okay, Oprah. Oprah. I mean, I love Oprah. I think she's wise. I think she's funny. I think she's insightful. And I think um, uh, I would just love to meet Oprah. I just think she's amazing. What is your favorite vacation spot? Mm, my favorite vacation spot is my parents' house. It is so relaxing. They live at the beach in North Carolina. Okay. What is the thing that, you, uh, that surprised, surprised you the most? Um, or that was the most discomforting when you moved from Cincinnati to New York? Ooh. Um, I think the thing that surprised me the most was how uh, quiet it is. We live on the Upper West Side, right on Central Park, and um, I think there's this idea that New York is just busy and lots of people, and sure, that's true, but it also can feel like a neighborhood and that has been a pleasant surprise oh that's quite interesting yeah uh, well let's go back on vacation then uh, outside of going to your parents house um, what are the essential items that always take with you when you go on vacation mm, unfortunately my laptop and three books okay uh, paper books or ebooks Paperbacks, uh, definitely paperbacks. I cannot get into ebooks. I like to feel it. I like to turn the page down. I like to have it in my hands as paper. Uh, any book that you currently reading? 
oh my gosh, I'm reading the Alice Network, and it is incredible. Such a great book. What was your dream job growing up as a kid? Um, probably, what was my dream job? Well, hell, as a kid, I wanted to be a lawyer, but then I became a lawyer and thought that's boring as hell, so that's when I stopped that. <laughs> um, I'm probably in my dream job right now, but as a kid, I... You know, I probably wanted to be a veterinarian or something to work with animals. I do love animals. Okay. All right. The lawyer for the one is quite funny, actually. <laughs> all right. Uh, any last word of advice or wisdom? Um, no, just, I guess, um, you know, young people are pretty incredible and don't forget it, you know? What's the best way to follow you and do something strategic on social media? Um, probably Twitter at DS underscore strategic. All right. And uh, so we'll share all of this on our podcast notes. Anything on LinkedIn as well or Instagram or anything else? We're on uh, LinkedIn. Do something strategic is on LinkedIn. And I'm certainly on LinkedIn, Meredith Ferguson. So, yeah. Well, well thank you so much, Meredith, uh, Meredith, for being with us today. Thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Thanks for tuning in to the EX Podcast. If you want to learn more, visit our website at expodcast.com. If you want to find out more about our next conferences, go to expsummit.com. Finally, you can also find my manifesto on business to employee or B2E branding at b2ebranding.co. See you next week.